Can, am I on? Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. All right, well, my name is Robin. Uh, my wife and I, uh, there we go, teach marriage workshops and uh, relationship workshops. We teach a lot of people how to experience God's best in uh, their relationships, whether that's friendships or at, at work or in dating and in marriage. So Michael asked me to um, speak today on healthy relationships and marriage. Now, my plan for today, and by the way, I don't know if we're going to have slides like we have them, but there's a technology problem, so um, bear with me. So, there it is. Okay. My plan for today came from a conversation I had with Braden about six months ago. At that time, uh, Michael was out sick, and he wasn't sure if he might need someone to back him up one weekend. So, I planned to talk about conflict management and how to do that in a positive way that's uh, for the relationship and not just try to win over the person and talk about tools that we might have to do that and why we don't always use them. So I was excited about that, and I told Brayden, uh, my son, about that when we were working out one afternoon, and he said, you'd be perfect for that. And I said, wow, that's, I didn't expect it. I mean, I'm okay, but I wasn't expecting that kind of enthusiastic response, so I probed a little further by mistake, and he said, yeah, you're ideal. You know all about managing conflict. You just don't do it. <laughs> And then he came back and said, well, okay, so you do it most of the time, but sometimes you do have to come back and do it later. Um, I think I know people in this room who have had me come back later and do that. It's true. I do know a lot of tools about helping people and myself maintain joyful, fruitful relationships. A lot of tools, and I don't always use them uh, in the hard moments, especially moments of great tension. And that's a word that I want you to keep in mind as we go through today. Uh, and by the way, I know that you do that too. And so we all need uh, today. So our message is that we need a helper. And the scripture for the day is not there. So I'm just going to say it to you. Okay. It's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict or tension with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. All right. Most of us on the earth do want meaningful relationships that are secure and mutually beneficial. I mean, I know there are some people who don't, but most of us do. And because we're relational beings, we desire that because that's part of God's plan for us. It's part of how he gives us meaning, how he gives us peace, belonging, fulfillment, confidence, and freedom and joy and identity. Our relationships are part of his plan for that. So we want them to be good in our workplaces, among our friends, especially in our homes, and probably most importantly in our marriages. We yearn to have what Genesis 2, 24 and 25 shows, a husband and wife who know each other so well and trust each other so much that they're able to be bare before each other, completely naked in body, in mind, and in soul, and have no fear. That's what we want. And there's no shortage of tips and tools and advice on how to have good relationships. I mean, there's lots of experts out there who will tell you they have it all figured out. Just don't look at their life. There's a lot of marriage coaches that will say, just use this one more tool and you can have what you want in your marriage. Now, I just did something there. You'll see it in a minute. Or philosophers that say, get what you want. There, I did it again. Out of life, you be true to yourself and don't give yourself up. I can show you how to do that and have a good relationship that way. And there's plenty of lawmakers adding laws and rules to help us to do that. And my proposal today is that the marriage tools will not be used in the moments of high tension. I know that's what happens in my house. Laws and policies will not help us treat each other well. In fact, no level of education, no philosopher, no person can help us be right with God, save us, or help us treat each other right when our egos are bruised enough or stroked enough. We cannot do this on our own. We can all the day long learn new ways to do it, and we're just not going to do it. Because what ails us is not lack of tools or knowledge or policies or philosophies. It's a lack of God in our hearts. It's a heart problem. It always has been, and it always will be. Now, as someone who teaches a lot about relationships, you can imagine I have a lot of books on this subject. I have a lot that are not written from God's perspective, and they cannot help you. 
They have really bad advice. In fact, you don't even need to read them because what they tell you to do is what you're going to do when you're mad anyway. So don't bother. I have good books that are written from God's perspective. And I don't use them always when they count the most. And I know that you're the same way. We need help or we need a helper. That's the, where we're heading today. That's at a personal level. Now let's take this up to a nation. There's a lot of laws to help us have good relationships with one another, and they're being added all the time, every day. In fact, I met a Jewish deli owner a couple weeks ago, and he told me there are now 700 laws to be a good, devout Jew. I didn't know that. They're, he said, yeah, they keep adding them more and more and more. Um, why do they do that? Well, because we need them more and more and more because we're less nice to each other, and so we need more and more laws. So they're not working. Here's why. We have an internal enemy inside us. It makes us misuse our knowledge. It makes us pursue things that will destroy and reject things that will build. I call it the Genesis 3 selfie, selfish voice in me, because that's where it started. We saw it first in Genesis 3, when the first people said, I want to decide what's good for me. I want to be my own God, my way, my rules. And God let it happen, and he told them what to happen. Okay, men against women, men against men, you're going to fight from now on. From this point on, our basic intuition changed. It became selfish. And in that, we started hurting each other. And so now we're selfish and wounded at the same time. Now, how could two people who are selfish and wounded at the same time have a good relationship with each other? C.S. Lewis calls this state a bundle of self-centered fears, hopes, greeds, jealousies, and self-conceit. That's what we are on our own. It tends to provoke a fight-or-flight response, not just to real dangers, but to perceived threats of our wants. To resist, to attack, to retreat, to run away. And no knowledge is going to change this fundamentally. Our voice says, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and I don't want anybody to do that to me. That's what happens. And it talks the loudest when we have to keep a promise that's really hard, or when we've been hurt, or when we're tempted by something. That's when the voice talks. So what would that do to relationships? Well, I mean, what would it do to two who have that inside? A man and wife. Or three, you know, a family. Or ten, a work team. Or a hundred, a church. Or a thousand, a community. Or a million, a nation. What would that do? Well, we see what it would do. <laughs> it would take away our peace, our assurance, our purpose, and our fulfillment. We've got to have help. The book of Judges is the picture of what happens when we try to do things in our own knowledge. And all of human history is too. What I'm about to share is a brief summary of the entire history of the world. Now, you didn't plan on that this morning, so buckle up, okay? Bear with me. It usually takes years to study this. You're going to get the five-minute version, okay? I'm not talking about the United States. You'll think I am. I'm not. I'm talking about the Persians, the Babylonians, the Huns, the European nations, all of them, the Mongols, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese nations, many, many more. This is a common thread of what three independent studies found. The first study was Sex and Culture by J.D. Unwin of Har uh, Oxford University and a friend from Cambridge University. Family and Civilization by K.L. Zimmerman from Harvard University. And Fate of Empires by Sir John Bagot Glubb, a British commander of the Jordan Arab Legion. Now, they did not live in the same time period. They were not looking for the same things. They all found the same thing. And they were all confounded by what they found. They looked at every civilization for which there's enough written records to make some deduction of their culture and what the habits did to that culture. Are you ready to find out what they found? Okay. Now, what the, they were stunned. They found no exception to what I'm about to tell you, except one subsection, so this little group that they could not explain called Christians. I'll give you the tip there, okay? <laughs> and what they found starkly contrasted evolution theory. There's really two big pillars that evolutionary theory stands on. One is apes to people, of course, or whatever, dolphins to people. But the other is that human beings are getting better all the time, not just technologically, but in our ability to relate to each other. Our knowledge is saving us. That is the other pillar. That is why we don't study world history. 
entirely in school because it doesn't say that. Here's what it says. Now, there are two major ways that a civilization rises and falls. One's a short way. They get very powerful, and then they go into decline. The longer way, which is what I'll show you, well, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway, is um, we get powerful, and then we become expansive and intellectual, and then we decline. In both cases, the decline happens for the same reason, and I'll talk about it. Here we go. First stage is the rise. Each culture begins with a monotheistic religion. may not be our God, but it's some concept of a God and a conscience inside us that tells us what's right and wrong. Strong restraints of impulses, particularly, you can imagine, of the sexual kind, and safeguarding of family, husband and wife, children as the foundation is of their culture. This is what we build our culture around. The morality standard of the day is absolute monogamy. No sex outside of marriage, one and only one marriage for life. Impulses are very restrained and channeled into marriage for the purpose of elevating trust and goodwill in the society. This period is always associated with high courage and altruism, power and energy and creativity and unity and high industry. It seems like the people feel like they have something to fight for, die for. They do. They have families. They have cultures. And so they grow very powerful. Usually what they do is they will either create a culture or they will defeat a much more technologically advanced culture that is no longer morally centered and doesn't have the will to fight. That's what they'll do over and over. Hard work is the norm. The culture grows huge. Universities are formed to promote the core values of God and family. Harvard, Yale, things like that. Over time, we're about to enter the next stage. Relative prosperity sets in. Time and ease become plentiful. New ideas arise. The culture becomes enlightened. We reach an age of intellect. We're very smart now. Belief in God and religion declines now. People don't like the disciplines of God. They surely think there's a different way to do this and still get what we want. Universities crop up everywhere now. Now it's not just here and there. Every town has a university. This is not just now. Focus on changing, uh, focus of the universities moves from God to enlightened ideas. How can we promote the new enlightened ideas in the culture and change laws by the new ideas? That's what the schools do now. The new enlightened idea always has a component that we no longer need to restrain our impulses because now we're smart enough to do it without consequence. Our own knowledge and intellect becomes the instruments for justifying the removal of our impulses. The thinkers say, well, now we're smart enough to prove that what we're really itching to do is really the right thing to do. We can get away with it now because we're smart. So the impulses are unbridled rapidly. This period is always associated with an increase of selfishness, cowardice, discord, and mayhem, and productivity starts to go down. But nobody sees it yet. It takes several generations to see it. At first, it looks like we're getting our cake and eating it too. At this point, there is also a reduced, and I'm not going to say much about this because I don't want you to get mad at me, a reduced delineation of male and female roles in society. In large numbers, everyone in the home begins to work outside the home. I'll just say it like that. Children begin to grow up with no one in the home. Okay. Next, after this, very shortly after this, there's always a sexual revolution. And when that happens, sexual restraints are loosened dramatically. Sex is no longer acceptable only in marriage. And at this point on, the culture will end in three generations of 33 years, always. They never found an exception to this. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you. <laughs> okay, marriage is impacted heavily by this. Absolute monogamy becomes modified monogamy, one at a time. And it's easily replaced. Divorce becomes easy. People start getting married much later in life after sexual exploration. Marriage rates decrease rapidly. Divorce rates increase rapidly. There's a dramatic increase of single parents now. The government grows as singleness grows because crime is growing and economic needs are growing. You got to have welfare and you didn't need it when there was two people. So the government grows dramatically. Now we enter a decline phase. The strong push for egalitarianism continues, and complementarianism is the enemy of the state. Sexual practices become looser. Cultural influences 
um, try to have female exploration of sexuality as a major cultural push specifically. Men take advantage of that. People don't get married anymore. Low view of marriage, high view of non-marital sex means at this point, most adults are not married. Then the culture reach a, reaches a non-monogamy state or a zoolistic state. The nation becomes non-religious. Homosexuality and transgenderism were on the fringe, and now they're in the middle. I did say this is not America. Okay, good. These are not new things. I knew one of them was not a new thing. I didn't know about the other. I was surprised by that. Okay, social laws are added to make deviant behavior okay. Bestiality and pedophilia begin to be accepted. That's hard to even say, but it is the case. Relational thinking and collaborative productivity declines rapidly at that point. There's no moral compass or no national identity. Charity for one's fellow person falls off. It becomes a almost zero state. Political parties and social groups are no longer able to effectively put aside differences, even in times of emergency. They fight, fight, fight. There is no come to the middle anymore. The majority reaches a state of, I got mine, I don't care what happens to anybody else. More and more laws have to be added to protect the society, but they can't get enough police and military to be willing to fight and die for it to protect anyone, and so they're not helping. Now we reach the end. Productivity reaches a zero state. Crime and violence are out of control. At this point, the nation is no longer able to maintain social order or combat external threat, and the culture ends through collapse or takeover. Collapse would look like judges. Takeover would look like Babylon came and got us. And we've seen this before. So a summary from, sex, uh, from Age of Empires kind of tells the story. The only thing we learn from history is that men never learn from history. A sweeping generalization, perhaps. <laughs> One lasting every 250 years. A sovereign race has time to spread its virtues far and wide. And then another people with entirely different virtues take its place. They found no exception. Except one, there's this weird group called Christians. And they seem to keep focusing on their God, and they seem to stay focused on their disciplined practices, even when the culture fell in on itself. And when the culture died, they survived. And they ended up becoming a major part of forming the next one. Now, none of these researchers were Christians. They had no answer to why this was the case, and they didn't really care. They just noted that it was odd, and they couldn't understand it. Where we're going is why. We're about to transition back to one-on-one -on -one relationships. But in case I'm scaring anybody or thinking, oh my gosh, the end of the world is coming. Look, God is in control. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. And Psalm 91.7 is for you. A thousand may fall at your side, but if you do things my way, it will not come near you. So don't worry about that, okay? So let's just focus on us and God. Here it is. The Bible speaks about everything I just talked about, all right? Proverbs 14.12. There is a way in which seems so right to a man at the end, it's death. We are so sure we can do this right on our own this time. It's been done before, Ecclesiastes 1.9. There is nothing new under the sun. It will happen again and again and again. And the old days weren't better either, Ecclesiastes 7.10. So don't say that. Don't say the good old days. That is stupid. That's what the verse says. <laughs> That's the original Greek. <laughs> now listen. Seriously, like Claire and I do watch some old shows sometimes. Like I watch Dobie Gillis and all those and Andy Griffith. And I do sometimes think, gosh, it does really seem like it was better back then. You know, my son, who again is wiser than me, he said, well, I don't think you'd think that way if you were black or Spanish or Chinese or Italian or anything else, would you? No, it wasn't better. We're in the same cycle over and over. So what can deliver us from this trap? the Holy Spirit can deliver us. The entire book of Galatians, and I'm going to do a really short survey of it, is that message that Jesus meant it when he said the Holy Spirit will live inside you and will guide you and direct you to do the things that I've said will help you and save you. Galatians says it saves us in two ways. We're only going to talk about the second one. First is we get salvation. We cannot go to heaven without God's help. We can't earn it. The second way is when we are saved, God is willing to live in us as the Holy Spirit, and he can now live through us to help us do what we cannot do and don't even want to do on our own. So what's going on in the book is Paul went and started some churches there, and then he's moving on because, you know, he's a busy guy, and he checks back in, and he sees them going crazy. 
And he's like, what is going on? That's the book. It's probably like what Moses thought when he came down from the mountain. Can I not leave you alone for five minutes and you totally lose control? What happens is some Judaizers are coming in, some people who um, want to take over, and they're telling all the churches, no, 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 you have to follow a bunch of rules and laws. And by the way, they're not talking about the Ten Commandments and Micah 6, 8 and love your neighbor. They're talking about stuff like we get to wear funny hats and have smoke on our head and you pay us money. That, those kind of laws. They want to control the people. And Paul's coming back going, why are you doing this? You have what you need. Those laws didn't save you before. They can't save you now. And so here comes the summary. I'm sorry you can't see it, so I'm going to tell you the verse numbers so you'll know where we are. Galatians 1, 6, and 7. I am astonished that you are so quickly losing the one who called you. What is happening? Why have you let these people trick you? 113. We're skipping through because we're going to one message thread. You know what my previous life was. That's what Paul says. You know what I was like. You saw it. No laws saved my soul, did they? They didn't help me treat anyone better. Paul was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisee. And what did he do with all that knowledge? He murdered people and persecuted people, thinking he was doing something good because he was so special. Just like the entire history of the world just showed. It didn't help me. It won't help you. That's what he's saying. 123. The man who formerly persecuted is now preaching. That's what Paul said. Something happened to me. God did in me what I could not do by myself. And then now I'm preaching to the very people I was trying to kill. I didn't expect it either. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He was reshaped. His heart was changed. And his eyes were opened. Now he could see people as God sees them. Equally valuable. Made in his image. Not someone um, in all his relationships were no longer his relationships. But they're us under God. And I'll do what I can in it. That's what he found. 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I am no longer living, but Christ in me. Paul does not take the credit. He says, it's Jesus, it's not me. He's living in me now as the Holy Spirit. Now, some would challenge the Christian message here. And they would say, well, no, no, no. I help people. You know, I'm good to people. And a good question back would be, to what limit? I mean, until they hurt you, until they disappoint you one too many times, how about if they're throwing rocks at you to kill you? That's what Paul was able to do. Can you imagine being able to do that? I mean, someone's trying to kill you with rocks, and you get up with your blood, and you go back in and say, okay, where was I? Let me keep talking to you. I mean, what would that take? That would take the Holy Spirit, I would think. All right, that's what he's saying. Now let's go all the way forward to chapter 5. This is what the Holy Spirit does to us. 11 and 12. Oh, this is important. If I'm still talking about laws, this is 11, why do you think I keep being persecuted by all the lawmakers? That's what he says. That's a good question. What is he talking about? And then he goes on to talk about the offense of the cross. Well, this is it. It's the message of the day. Our intuition is messed up. No knowledge can save us. No professor, no president, no high fluting philosopher can save us. We can't do it. That's the message of the cross. And it's offensive to our Genesis 3 voice. This is, I want to do it. I mean, you ever wonder why is the Bible so persecuted? I mean, one reason is, of course, Christians who don't act like Christians. I mean, that makes people mad. But the other possible reason is they don't like the message. I mean, all we're taught to do is work hard, tell the truth, pay our taxes, obey our governors. Who would not want that? I mean, I would want an entire country full of people like that. But it also says those governors are not going to save you. That school is not going to save you. That president will not save you. Nothing can save you from yourself. You need God to do what you cannot do. That's pretty offensive. And that's why they're persecuted. 5, 14, and 15. The whole law, the real law, not this stuff about funny hats and smoke, is love your neighbor as yourself. Just do that. That's what Paul says. That's the crux. If you keep biting and devouring each other, you will destroy each other. That's the verse. That's it. Sir, do not be ruined and serve our selfish desires, but serve one another in love and not the hallmark kind either. 
If you, you know it's the Hallmark card, I love what you do for me. That's what they all say. And as soon as you stop doing it, I'm not going to love you anymore. <laughs> That's it. Don't do that. I love you because I can. Or maybe because Jesus loved me and I'll love you. That's what he's saying. 516. We need God's spirit. So I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh that are messing you up. The flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict. So that's our key verse. There's a key message here. Watch out here. We got to have God's Holy Spirit in us. If we don't, there's not going to be any conflict because we are just so going to hate what the Bible says. We're just not going to even do it. It's not even going to bother us. That is stupid. It doesn't even make sense. Why would I do anything that the Bible says? Even when we get God's Spirit in us, we're going to feel conflict. In fact, that's a good way to know. If you're having a problem in a relationship and you know what you're supposed to do is apologize for your part and you don't want to and you're going, oh, that's good news because that means the Spirit's in there because otherwise you wouldn't be in that conflict. So do what the Spirit says and see what happens. And that's, that's what's happening. It's not easy. He didn't take away our decision-making. we got to choose, and we have to choose to follow the Spirit when he prompts us, when we really don't want to. Now, Paul gives us the picture of what it looks like when we don't listen, and that's in 19 through 21. He calls it the acts of flesh. I'm not going to read them all, but he said, just in case, in case you need to see this, that's what your selfie, selfish voice is going to produce. I have gave you a list, all right? And then in 22 and 23, he says, and in case you're not sure when the Holy Spirit is prompting you, here's the list. This is what he's going to prompt you to do. Forbear, be patient, love, joy, control yourself, be faithful when you don't want to. That's it. So when you feel that tension, trust God in it. And don't trust what your selfish voice is trying to tell you because it's messed up. And it's wounded, too. You can't trust your instinct. That's what it's saying. Now, the good news is, over time, as we do this more and more and more, our instinct does change because we learn, wow, trusting God does seem to work, and it becomes easier. But boy, is it hard at first. And it never becomes just, you don't even have to think about it. All right, let me tell you a story here. Let me give you a Bible promise and tell you a story. Psalm 1 is my favorite um, probably my favorite passage of the Bible. And I really start to think that Psalm 1 in the book of Galatians is like, this is the message right here. Listen to the promise of Psalm 1. Blessed is anyone whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted in stream, by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season and its leaves will never wither. That's a good promise from God. What fruit is it going to yield? The fruit of the Spirit, I just said, love, joy, peace, patience, the kind of stuff that will build your relationship. If you will stay close and do what God said, even when you don't want to do it, that's what it will grow. And if you want to be married for a lifetime, that's what will make it happen. You're not going to want to. And that's the problem. We have a hard time experiencing this blessing because we don't want to do it. And we get God's Spirit in us, and he says, do it. Here's a story. I'll, t- I'll tell you a, a, like a cute story and then a hard story from my life. Uh, you can, the Spirit can help you with other people too. So I have an employee who um, came to me one time. We're in a one-on-one meeting. He's not my buddy. He's an employee, so I have to be very careful about what I say. I can't be just throwing Bible verses out. So he, he starts telling me about how excited he is that his girlfriend's about to move in with him. He's like, oh, I'm so excited. They've been, li- they've been dating four or five years. Well, I'm not terribly excited about this because I know the stats on this. I know what happens. So they move in together. Here's, here's, here it is. Uh, ladies start getting real uncomfortable when they move in together because they feel like, wow, something's not right here, and they really want to get married. And the guys really don't because like, why do I get married? I mean, I'm getting what I want. So they, they move in together, and that's what happens, and usually it doesn't work out most of the time. Um, and this, by the way, is one of those examples of the thinkers trying to decide what we're really itching to do is really a good thing to do. I mean, culture says, do it. Yeah, that's a good thing. It was a terrible thing. It's the worst thing you could do if you want to be married. And I know this, and I wanted to be married for a long time because it's a great girl. So the Holy Spirit talks to me. You know what I mean. Like, it didn't, like I didn't hear the words, but I heard them. 
and I promise you this is what he said. Appeal to his ego. That's what he said. And so I said, oh, really? Well, you know, she's really beautiful and really nice. God, I hate to lose her. And he's like, what? What are you talking about? I said, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I know if, if it were me, like I'd want to put a ring on that before I, I had Claire move in with me because she's going to see all my bad habits. And she's got options, man. I mean, I want to lock her in. So, and he's like, oh, you think so? Well, that's what I would do. They're married now. So I'm just telling you, that, that's the story. <laughs> All right, here's the tougher story. So the Holy Spirit can do it. I wouldn't have thought of that. All right. I grew up in a household where marriage was not working. Um, my first dad left when I was five. Uh, my stepdad and mom fought like cats and dogs. Um, I'm talking a weekly recurring situation, door slamming, furniture breaking, holes in walls, fighting. And my stepdad going out, leaving for days, and my mother saying, Okay, we're getting a divorce. That was like every week from the time I was in sixth grade until college. And so that's all I ever saw. If there was a conflict, that was the result. All right? When I decided to marry, that was not going to be what I would do. So I was going to learn a bunch of tools to make sure we didn't ever have a conflict because I was going to do everything right. I bought books, went to seminars and all that sort of thing. I was confident. And that lasted like, I don't know, a couple days into our marriage. So... We had our first disagreement, and without even realizing what I was saying, these words just spilled out. We should get a divorce. I couldn't even believe it was happening. Inside, it's not what I want. Inside, my heart's going, don't abandon me. Now, I didn't even recognize that that was what was happening, but I definitely didn't want to get a divorce, but that's what's thrown out there. Now, I should mention that Claire was very mature in her faith at this point. She had been practicing the Lord's way and listening to his spirit for long time. I was very new. I was not used to hearing God, and I wasn't hearing him in this argument. All I was hearing was my fear, and I couldn't see what was going on. So I probably did that 10 or more times in the first year of our marriage. It was a hard first year. Well, one time I did it, and I threw out, we should just get divorced, and I saw something break in her countenance that I hadn't before. Like, her whole face fell down, and it looked so sad, and it hurt me. I realized I had really hurt her this time. And then it squinkled up and got really mad looking, and her face turned red, and I was like, she's going to kill me right now. So what am I going to do? And then it softened, and she stood up on a chair, because I'm meh, 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 whatever I was saying. She had to stand up. She'd get my attention. And she looked at me with this calm voice that said, and said, you can leave me if you want to. I can't stop you, but I will never leave you. Well, no one had ever said anything like that to me. I'd never seen selflessness like that. That pierced my heart, and it saved our marriage. How was she able to do that? I mean, I was being a jerk. You shouldn't do that to people. I mean, you shouldn't threaten things you don't mean. You know, at least mean it. No, I'm just kidding. You, you, should, you should, this is crazy. I'm hurting the person I love the most. And she's able to say that. Well, here's what happened is she experienced a strong knowing. That's the best way we can describe it. This is not you, Claire. This is about his dad. How would she know this? I didn't even know this. She was right. I thought I got over that years ago. No. And I saw a pattern of every relationship I had up to that point. It gets to a certain point, and I bail, because I do not want them to bail on me like my dad did. And I'm trying my best to bail on the best thing that ever happened to me. And the Holy Spirit saved our marriage. I'm telling you, you need the Holy Spirit in your life, and you need to listen to him. I mean, I had the Spirit, but I wasn't listening yet. I didn't know how to listen yet. Thank goodness my wife knew how to listen. That was 24 years ago, two kids ago, 10 ministries ago, hundreds, maybe thousands of people that we may be touched in some way ago. None of it without the Holy Spirit leading Claire that day. So here's what what I would say about all this. Don't be afraid of what I said on world history. I mean, do your best to make your culture good. We should do that. We don't be afraid. Get out there. But just know that the Lord's promises are right. 10,000 may fall at your side. You'll be fine if you do things my way, but you're going to have to trust me and listen to me. 
And the only way you're going to do that is the Spirit, because your self is going to make you do everything that would be terrible for you and the people around you. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you do not have anything to override that voice. You're not going to be able to have the kind of relationship you want, because you will be your own worst enemy. So I say for your sake, for the sake of anybody who has to live with you, and for the sake of your Creator who loves you and knows what's good for you and the person with you, please take Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you haven't, you can do it right now. All you have to do is say, Jesus, you're God. I'm not. I choose that, that I'm not. Save me. Be my Lord and Savior and come live in me. That's it. He'll do it right now, and you'll be started on that journey. Now, those of us who have the Spirit, we don't always listen to Him. Now I've showed you where. It's in that moment of tension when, oh, no, I don't want to do it His way because I'd have to be really vulnerable. And He says, yeah, be really vulnerable to me. Trust me. My hope and prayer is that we will do that. We can trust Him with heaven It's funny, I can't believe I'm saying this. This is a thing pastors say. We can trust him with heaven, let's trust him with now. True. We can. Let's listen to him. Once we've committed to that, then maybe some of those books that I have might help us, you know. Um, But until then, they won't, because we won't use them. Let me pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your book. It's the most important book. It tells us how to have the kind of relationships we yearn for. But I know we won't use what's there without you. We'll think it looks silly. And we'll do things that hurt us and the people around us. My prayer is that we will come to you and we'll say, you live in me. And when you help, when you reach into us and say, do this my way right now. And just trust me over your instinct. We'll do it. Because I know in my own life that we'll see how good that is. And I pray that anyone here today who doesn't have you would get you. Man, I I don't know what I would do without you. I'd probably be dead by now. And I pray that those of us who do have you will listen to you, will trust you in that moment where our wounded, selfish spirit wants to do something else. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you made that choice today, you can come now. Come up. I'll be glad to talk to you. One of my peers will be glad to talk to you. Or just afterwards, I'll hang around. Come talk to me. I want to celebrate that with you and help you, just like someone helped me.